Welcome college basketball fans to the Full Court Press Podcast with LT and Sammy D. This is the podcast that brings you legendary stories from college basketball's golden era and dives in deep with the current analysis of today's game. Get ready for the most energetic and entertaining college basketball podcast around. Let's get it. Hello and welcome to another great American Athletic Conference college basketball podcast. Sorry, excuse me. Another guest from the American Athletic Conference, but I am still Luke Taylor and he is Sam Davidson, full court court press podcast, a college basketball experience. I'm working on that. Thanks for coming. Thanks for listening. And don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. We have a new Twitter handle or X handle at LT and Sammy D1. Also follow us at Facebook if you love the podcast. If you like the podcast, you can maybe send me some money for my new fade this week or next. Um, subscribe, rate, and review, like, comment, and share it. But uh, we got another great episode, and we're talking to another American Athletic Conference coach, which, you know, I think we need to start a network, which we've been talking about, and maybe do an athletic American Just conference. Just focus on the AAC. I mean, they're, I know. they know. They it's showed up last year. It, it's a fantastic conference. Yeah, they uh, only got two bids, one Automic and yeah. one uh, Florida Atlantic. Should have got three. Yep, yep. They should have gotten three for sure. So, yeah. What do What do you want to tell our uh, tell our audience about our next guest here? I'm Where, I'm excited. You know, I mean, I, I grew up in Kansas City, so this team was always kind of in the background of like the Big Eight, the Big Twelve. You know, growing mm-hmm. up around like KU, MU, K State. You know, like it's, mm-hmm. and then this program, you know, it's like they have such a rich history that you don't hear about on a national level. Right. And, you know, you throw out some names in the beginning of this next episode. And one of my give favorite, it to you. I mean, it's one of, he's, he's Xavier McDaniels, like one of my favorite college basketball players ever. And he was even kind of before my time, but it's like, you look back at like, when Super you look sonics. back at his stats and some of his highlights and everything, I mean, it, what a force to be reckoned with. And then you got guys like Fred Van Fleet, Ron Baker, Austin Reeves now with the Lakers. Like, I mean, it's like, there is such a rich program there. You forgot about Cliff Levingston, who was on the Bulls. Cliff Levingston. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 It's, it's interesting, but no one ever talks about Greg Marshall. Whatever happened to Greg Marshall? I don't know. I don't know. It's we'll have to look it up for me. Yeah. Uh, That's all I got. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, but What's yeah. the movie Forgetting Sarah Marshall? What's that one? <laughs> yeah, Forgetting Sarah Marshall. Yeah, um, well, we forgot no, about Greg, Greg Marshall. Marshall I mean, one of the winningest coach in uh, Wichita State uh, Shockers basketball history. So, I mean, yeah. really kind of put them on a map of consistency is what I'd call mm. it. Um, but, yeah, I mean, our next go- guest is uh, Coach Paul Mills. Took over the head coaching duties last year, finished his mm-hmm. first year there. Um, one of the hottest names in the coaching carousel Prior to that, when he uh, took Oral Roberts to a new level, you know, took him to a Sweet 16 one year, um, 2022, 2023. Um, they had 30 wins in the season, undefeated in conference. And um, yeah, it was kind of a natural transition. You, everyone kind of thought he was going to go somewhere right after that season. And yeah, he, he selected Wichita State. Wichita State selected him. And um, what a great guy. I love this next episode. Yeah, and I, and I like that if anything ever happens to his coaching career, he can be a painter. He can be a painter. That's, I mean, just an interesting, like, obviously didn't do it, he's never done it for the money. Yeah. Uh, you know, the one thing we forgot to talk about, when he became, uh, when the assistant coach, oh, what was his name, went from Baylor to North Florida, he got his car, his Chrysler 300M, and uh, I guess Coach Mills had a, a Honda Accord, and he gave it to a woman he never met, only the first time he gave it to her, he met her. She used to, he'd always see her waiting for the bus and he actually gave it to her. I mean, yep. who does that? I would have sent, sold that shit on like Craigslist or Facebook marketplace made my, know. you know, but like, just, just you know, the, I him. mean, salt, salt to the earth. Like he's one of those coaches where it's like, once you're in five or 10 minutes of conversation with them, you're like, I, I want to have this guy over for dinner with my family. You know, it's yeah. like you, 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 you just that automatic trust, you believe what he's building, you believe in his vision, you know, that, you know, your kids would be 
in the right atmosphere with him, you know, with, mm -hmm. with him and his direction. And, um, yeah, the, the, he, some of his responses, uh, so <laughs> unique, so charismatic spirit and animal. It made me a bigger fan of his after the, after the, the 30 minutes we spent with him, yeah. you know, when I'm starting, uh, obviously a yeah. big, uh, Hoosiers, the movie Hoosiers fan, yeah, you, um, you asked me a little a bit about times that. What, who's, you, who's your favorite character in Hoosiers? I love Jimmy Chipwood. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I think yeah. he was a ladies man, yet he didn't talk, but whatever. Or no, isn't who was the guy? Isn't who was the, the little short guy with the buzz cut? Like the Fessler of the Ollie. movie. Ollie. Ollie. I liked Ollie yeah. too. Yeah. Ollie was Ollie's cute. good. My favorite cute. character was Dennis Hopper's character, Shooter. I feel yeah. like the movie, while it was uh, s centralized around um, Gene Hackman's character as the coach and mm -hmm. what he was building like the dennis hopper story as shooter like that was like he overcomes adversity you know it's that father-son relationship with this kid on the team you know coach mills in this episode talks about like using your gift finding your gift and using it you know like shooter was able to use his gift and his love for basketball you know by the end of that movie so um Good movie, good upcoming episode with Coach Paul Mills from the Wichita State Shockers, and uh, they're going to have a great year this year, I think. Yeah, you know? but not just him, but think about the American Athletic Co Conference. I mean, yeah. that is a – I'm really – all the coach we've had – now we've had Coach Hodge, we've had Coach Amir, we've had mm -hmm. Coach Jacus, we've had now Coach Mills. <clears throat> I'm missing someone. Who else am I missing? Is that it? Yeah. We've only had four. Last I think we've like, wow, we've, we've uh, interviewed some pretty powerful – um, coaches in that conference. Yes. Yeah. So, you gotta get coach they're, Hardaway. They're it, to be reckon with. Yep. And, you know, I mean, the, 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 the stat that you throw out there that we got from a coach, you know, 15, all league players, you know, first team, mm -hmm. second year, third year, or first team, second team, third, third team out of those 15 players, 14 of them got cherry picked to go to different schools. Right. I mean, what does that tell you about? I mean, it's the most picked over conference in the country. So, yeah. Yep. Well, let's, it's let's high, get into it. highly competitive and yeah, let's get into it. LT. Yeah. Let's get into it. So enjoy coach mills of the Wichita state shockers. Let's get it. Sam. I'm really excited with our next guest. It's like X going to give it to you. And, and this program in school recently with, uh, with a guy named Fred van fleet, some guy named Ron Baker, but I'm going to tell you about Wichita state and the shockers. No one ever, no one ever talks about the X Man. I love it. Yeah, one Xavier of McDaniel. Yeah, I mean, probably top thirty-five, top fifty college basketball players ever. If you actually talk to the right people, you know. Yeah, yeah, and he had a team. He was with Cliff Levingston yeah. and uh, Austin Carr, and they were. I mean, they were good. But the thing about Xavier McDaniel, which Coach might not even know, he actually shaved his eyebrows and head, <laughs> starting I think at Wichita State to make a more like rough and tough and they actually one of his huh. nicknames was half dead did you know that coach half I dead was one this of is all news to me. <laughs> and i saw xavier um he he's a, he's in wichita quite a bit during the summer and yeah. i saw him i guess about a month ago so i'm excited about seeing him the next time and mentioning that to him yeah can he, <laughs> actually can he still play uh, you know what i i think it's one of those things because i've talked to enough nba players it's one of those things where if, if I know I'm going to win, I'll play. If there's <laughs> any guess at all about whether or not I'm going to come out on the right side of this, I'm just, you know, I'm too old. The game's passed me by, young fella. You know, I, the, the, these guys are not going to go on the losing end and let allow somebody <laughs> to get credibility using their name. No. Well, we would like to welcome Paul Mills, Wichita State head men's basketball coach, the Shockers to the Full Court Press podcast, which is a college basketball experience. But in the last month or so, I feel like we're the American Athletic uh, Conference official college basketball podcast because I think you're you're our fifth guest out of maybe 10 from the American Athletic Conference. So we're really in excited past, to talk to you today. Yeah. 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 Well, well, welcome, thank coach. You. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So I guess let's just get right into it. Do you still paint? Uh, I, I don't know where that ever came from, but I've actually never painted. So, you, you know, there's probably a lot of stuff that's on the Internet, maybe quotes that are attributed to me. 
but I, so you I, never I, you, know, you, you never right. painted 1261 steps at Tudor oh, Field. Oh, okay. Now, now paint, <laughs> I, I'm thinking like paint as in art. Uh yeah. yeah. But I painted steps. Uh <laughs> I've painted houses. Uh I grew up in Houston, and so being at Rice University for a year, I poured concrete one summer, I roofed houses one summer. And I said to myself, I'll work in air conditioning. So fortunately, that job, painting the steps at Wright <laughs> University in order to get the, the $150 a month that they were giving me, um, the, the, is a little bit more than that, is about $160. But in order to get that $81 check every two weeks, uh, I did have to paint the steps at Rice University, what was then called Autry Court. And thank goodness it was air conditioned. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness is right, especially down there. That's for sure. So I love that you know exactly still how much you got paid for that job, right? Yeah, I mean, to two thousand dollars not a very hard number to to come <laughs> up with. Uh, you know, if you get two thousand dollars for the year, I told Willis Wilson was the head coach at the time, and I asked him. I said, "Listen, I, I I've not ever had money, and I I grew up without it, so that's not that big of a deal." Here's my only question, Coach Wilson is will I get to sit on the bench during games? Uh, because I was doing some video work and breaking down things behind the scenes. He says, you can sit by me. And I said, I'll take it. Uh, so <laughs> that, 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 that was all it took in order for me to take uh, and agree to that salary. Yeah. yeah. Now, when I look at your, uh, your background, right, like where you came from and the coaching leading up to being the head coach at Wichita State, it's a really interesting journey, right? And I mean, it's like, it, it seems like even during that journey, you may have taken jobs where you got paid less during certain times, which today it's kind of unheard of, right? You know, but it kind of takes that. I mean, did you have this path in mind with where you wanted to end up? Um, I, I don't think anybody. Decades. Yeah, I don't think anybody ever has a path. I remember being at Rice University, and and there was one of the assistant coaches, Todd Smith. Um, I, I wanted to be an assistant, just like everybody who eventually became a head coach. And and uh, where we were located there in the medical district at Rice University, <laughs> he said, "Paul, there, there's a, there's about a thousand assistant coaches in the country." Um, he says a lot of schools right now, they don't have all three assistants. But when you think through the 350 schools, there's about a thousand. He says there are a thousand cancer doctors right across the street at MD Anderson Hospital. He said that's how hard this profession is and difficult to get into. And so I remember that it was a great perspective for me. And to be honest with you, one, I do consider it divine. Um, uh, but for me, I, I just wanted to operate in my gift. I wanted to operate in where I felt I was called to do. And I, I saw what basketball did for me. I tell people I played division two basketball and I would go back to my neighborhood and there were players that were much better than me. And I would tell them, guys, you know what? This scholarship gets me breakfast. Hey, have you ever thought of anything that being able to play basketball, you get they feed you for free. And that was kind of mind blowing to me that you could get breakfast simply because you were a good basketball player. You got lunch and dinner too. But the fact that I could get three square meals a day simply because of a, of a skill. And I wanted to go back into my neighborhood and tell players, if you'll act right uh, and you'll go about this the right way, there are benefits to the game of basketball that go beyond our little neighborhood right here that mm -hmm. you may not be aware of that can open doors. And so for me, I just want to kind of herald that call and, uh, and saw a number of players, uh, I wish my gift was playing, like every basketball player in the world. What I realized was my gift was helping. And I just wanted to help so many kids, specifically in my neighborhood at that time, enjoy the benefits of basketball. Yeah, how were you introduced to basketball? You know, it's we, we have the privilege of interviewing Sam, he says he's from Houston. Well, he's from Houston, Aldi in Texas. And I, what I want to kind of get to is like son of a pastor, right? You know, it yeah. sounds like you grew up in a really strong church community. And it's like the, 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 there's so many coaches who we've interviewed, right, who have this kind of faith-based background. And so like what, is, like what is the connection between like, you know, growing up in that atmosphere, that environment, the call to service, and then the call to coaching. It seems like there's a big connection there, right? Well, I, I think both, despite media reports, uh, both are probably poor. Uh, my, my father <laughs> as a pastor was poor. I mean, he made a hundred dollars a week. And I know that because I would ask my mom for Air Jordans and she would always say, can we eat them? 
And she said, son, we can only buy things that we can eat. Uh, we can't buy anything mm -hmm. else. And so it was just one of those deals where basketball is the sport of the poor. I couldn't afford cleats and a helmet and shoulder pads. And I sure uh, couldn't. Have, I, I've gone by and priced baseball mitts. Holy cow. Uh, I just wanted to play catch with my daughter. I'm like, these things are $250 for this regular baseball mitt. And I sure couldn't afford a baseball glove and a baseball bat. But you could run down the end of the street. And you could play with 12, 15 other kids with one rubber ball. And you see that, I think, in Europe. You see soccer uh, in Africa. You see soccer is kind of the sport of a, the poor. In basketball, it's America. And, and so those of us who did not grow up in strong socioeconomic situations, usually people uh, whose parents may have been called in ministry, um, that, that's kind of how we grew up. And so I, I think a lot of people in distress socioeconomic situations uh, you find a way to entertain yourself. And this was the cheap way to entertain yourself. So that's why that's why for me, basketball, uh, I just I absolutely loved it. I grew up in my mind in the golden era. So not only would you play, but you would get in these heated discussions about was it Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson or Larry Bird? And yeah. you would get into these heated discussions. And I grew up in Houston, so we still had, you know, you had the Bulls winning three in a row and then you had – Akeem Elijah won, and, and that group went in back-to-back -back titles. Shaquille O'Neal. So you were enamored with it just through all facets and had a phenomenal high school coach who opened up the gym uh, to allow all of us kids to get in out of the heat. And so you, I was around it constantly, and I just loved it. Yeah, yeah. What, yeah, what's amazing to me when I was doing a little bit of research, uh, I mean, amazing to me that you painted 1,261 steps. And <laughs> if you're ever in the Akron area, I had to do it. Uh, yeah, steps. I had to do it twice because the first coat of paint didn't didn't work. So I, I should actually <laughs> double that number. But, so so it should it should be uh, uh, 2,512 or in 22. Yeah. 22. There you go. So what I find very interesting, I, I was talking to Sam about this just kind of briefly last night, is that two of your top three scores are returning from last year, which in the American Athletic Conference is unheard of. Because <laughs> as you know, out of 15 all-league selections, and uh, Coach Hodge told us this from North Texas, he said that only one guy is coming back, and it's the, the, the Axel from... Um, yeah, from, from UAB. UAB yeah, which because yeah, he's foreign. <laughs> yeah. So, what were those conversations like? I mean, I know one's a redshirt senior, one's an uh, Xavier Bell's a senior too. What were those conversations like at the end of last season? I, I think one, they have to happen very fast. Uh, so for us, I, I had end of season meetings within 24 hours of all the players. So. We lose in um, the third round of the AAC tournament and uh, end up losing to UAB, who goes on and wins it. And, but you beat Memphis. You know, Coach, you beat Memphis. Yeah, you, you know, and, and, and you know, you're, you're trying to uh, – you realize I, – I, for me, I didn't understand the caliber of player that was required in order to be. It was my first year in the league. I thought I had an idea. Uh, and I thought we, we were well suited. But I tell you, the one thing that happens when you take a job is you go in, go into the locker room, you say, guys, how many of you guys are staying? And seven hands shoot up. And and you in your mind, you go, all right, I got to go get six guys. You know, I got to fill this roster out with 13. But the reality is, is you don't know those seven. You know, I, I, I've never been around you. I've seen you on film, but I don't know if you're willing to to do tough things. I don't know how committed you are to this process. I don't know how you're committed you are to me. You may have signed up for somebody else. Uh, so you may not necessarily vibe with, with us and our staff. And, and again, so I, I had meetings immediately after we returned five of our top seven. Um, I, I've been fortunate, you know, wherever I've been, whether, whether it was at Baylor, whether, whether even at Rice um, and, and then at ORU, uh, I've always thought retention is the name of the game. You have to be able to retain guys that that are important to you. And in order to do so, um, they have to see a vision for themselves moving forward. So all of that gets painted within 24 hours. And, and then you have an idea about what it's like, uh, you know, and it's good because the second you get done playing 24 hours later, you can begin to navigate, you know, your 24, 25 year. Mm-hmm. How's that going for you? 
Uh, great. It, I, I love, I absolutely love the guys in our locker room. Um, I, I remember after our first practice, the staff came over. We, I mean, we meet immediately after practice and just kind of talk through that particular day. And, and they just said, wow, this is as competitive group. And I just said, well, it's, it's day one. Everybody's competitive on day one. And then day yeah. 10, it was like, this is the most competitive group we've had. Now, it's it's not been a long process here. We, we've been here for a year. But I, I will tell you the character of our locker room and the competitiveness of it, I'm, I'm grateful uh, for the guys that came back. And I'm extremely happy about the guys that we've added. Yeah. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about what the makeup of your team it looks like this coming year? You know, like yeah, in, I, I will tell in you. the summer that's kind of surprising you? Yeah, I, I will tell you from a, my philosophical perspective, I, I do believe you have to get the most out of every possession. So so fortunately for me, the last four years I was at ORU, if you add up those four years, um, where we stood in ball security, we were always number one. We just, we just <laughs> didn't turn the ball over. And then last year, you know, we just – it, I think turning the ball over is going to hurt you. Not only is it offensively, but it's going to hurt you more so defensively in my mind because you're going to end up playing a lot of disadvantaged basketball. You're not going to get set defenses. So for me, I, we needed to get multiple point guards. And Justin Hill from the SEC uh, was a double-digit scorer um, in the SEC. He was third in assist rate in the SEC. So there's a guy who's done it. We returned two point guards from a year ago, and then we were able to add a high school point guard out of Houston, Zion Pipkin, who I'm very, very excited about. So we, we were able to shore up some backcourt, and then we needed to do a, a better job uh, shooting. If you look at South Florida, um, they were the top shooting team in our conference a year ago. They were also the top defensive team. And, and if you look at the teams that, that I was able to coach at ORU, they had those same components. Uh, we, we were able to shoot the basketball, and we were able to d defend at a really high level. And so for me, I ne we needed to address ball security, and then we needed to address some, uh, uh, some shooting issues. So Zane Meeks is a Kansas City kid who's a transfer from Arizona State who shot it well his entire career. Uh, A.J. McGinnis is a 40% three-point shooter who transferred to us. And then I think with the guys who we had, they'll get better. Bijan Cordes was a good shooter at Oklahoma, uh, struggled a year ago, but uh, he was only able to play half the season. So I, I, I think Justin Hill's a really good shooter, the transfer from Georgia. So I think we've been able to shore up two areas, and then we need to be much, much better defensively. We were fifth in our conference. But we, we do need to make sure that we're in the top three. Uh, and that's going to come down to can we rebound the basketball. Yeah. So, you know, Coach, there's, it sounds like you have a lot of ball handlers, a lot of shooters, but you know there's only one basketball. There, there is. And, and, and I think it's important, though, that you have multiple ball handlers because if, if Paul Mills is your only ball handler out there, people are going to go take the ball out of his hands. Coaches aren't stupid. And they're going to say throw it to these other four non-playmakers. And so yeah. I, I think I, I think what you what you see with a lot of good teams, whether it's Dallas with Kyrie and Luca, um, you know, I, I thought obviously Boston had ball handlers darn near at every position except even Porzingis uh, could could handle the ball at times. But I, I do think that you're going to have to put multiple playmakers out there, and I think good players understand that. You and I could sit here and say, "Hey, there's only one ball for that USA team," uh, but if you have high character. Uh, in your locker room, and they all understand the value of being able to attract two. Now, if you're Steph, you can shoot it with two on you. Uh, we don't have Steph Curry. Uh, but at the end of the day, if if guys understand that, man, if we'll play the right way, because I when I walked away from that USA game, uh, I shouldn't say walked away, walked away from my television screen. I just said, man, what a beautiful game uh, when it's done right. Like when yeah. you see guys who care about doing the right things and sharing it. So for me – even though there's only one basketball, you better have the talent on the floor because, again, coaches aren't stupid, and they're, they're going to get the ball out of certain players' hands, and you have to have multiple playmakers. So would you have played Jalen Tatum more than he did? Jason I know, man, you know what? I no, was Jalen. We're there. changing his name. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, I, w I was sitting there on, on the Serbia game, and mm -hmm. I was like, all right, you got to get, get Joel Embiid a rest. And like he's just battling over there with Jokic way too much. And then here comes Anthony Davis. And so a lot of my thinking substitution patterns, 
I don't know if that's necessarily you defer to veterans. I thought Steve Kerr made a great point. You can probably only play eight or nine guys in these 40 minute mm -hmm. games. These aren't 48 minute games and yep. there's not 82 of them. So you don't right. need all of these. And if you look at college teams, I mean, go look at UConn last year. They played seven guys. Um, and 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 the, you're only playing 32 games now. These guys get paid like they play 82, as one agent pointed out to me uh, with NIL. Uh, he, he, but at the end of the day, I, I do think somebody's going to be um, – not everybody's going to be able to play when you're only playing 40-minute games. Yeah. So, Coach, what what was your, I guess, first impression or initial impression after the first year in the American Athletic Conference? I mean, you're at Oral, Oral Roberts, did really well. Your your kind of stamp has been 14 years at Baylor, which is the Big 12, which is probably one of the best college basketball conferences, you know, especially this year with the addition of some teams. What was your kind of, an, what is like, if I said to you right after the season, like, tell me a little bit about the American Athletic Conference. What What would you say? Yeah, I, I thought we could play two bigs uh, because I thought it would be somewhat similar to what I experienced at, at Baylor. Uh, and in Big 12, you see that a lot. And it's a small ball four league. Um, there are a couple of teams that play two bigs, uh, Memphis and UAB, and they're the teams that, that do really well. And so th there is a combination. You kind of have to have a hybrid four. Uh, uh, that, that ability, somebody down low and somebody who can step out. Um, I don't know, and I thought, again, Yaxel, uh, who's who's going to be the preseason conference player of the year, he is the best big in the league, but he plays the four, and, and he plays bully ball. So if you don't have a level of physicality, even at that finesse small ball four spot, you're in trouble. Um, and so you, it, it's a very unique league, and I think you have to figure out, but the majority of the league is small ball four, a finesse four. But you're going to have to be able to play both in this league. You're going to have to uh, – when I came from ORU, all five guys were skilled. And uh, you had to have one through five that were skilled. You didn't have to have that in the Big 12. You usually had two, three, four bullies. I don't know if you remember the name Quincy AC at all. Uh, oh, yeah. Quincy AC is an assistant for me uh, here uh, at Wichita State. But, I mean, he played the four fours at Baylor, and he couldn't hit water if he fell out of a boat. I mean, he, he was six feet and in. Uh, and so I, I think you kind of have to. Now, he he made himself. He was seven years in the NBA and turned yeah, himself. I think I just I – he did pretty yeah, well. He, just resigned. he turned himself into a 43% three-point shooter in the NBA. But when he was in college, he was just a bully. And yeah. so in this league, you have to have both. You have to be able to have a finesse four uh, when those times call for it, and you have to have a level of physicality. So I think that's really unique about, about the AAC. Yeah. Do you see any parallels with when you took over at Oral Roberts, right? You know, and then you, I'll, I'll call it a rebuild what you did there. And, you know, you got, you brought the program into the sweet 16, your last year there, you got 30 wins, you know, and then you move into Wichita state and it's kind of the same situation that I'm looking at right on paper. Right. Um, do you see parallels of what you did at ORU and what you're trying to do at Wichita state? Yeah, you know, uh, at ORU, you inherited a team that had won six Division One games and what was in last place um, and just kind of fell on tough sledding. Obviously, they had a long history of doing well. Um, I, I feel to some degree that way about the situation here. You know, I'm reminded uh, uh, Coach Turgeon took a team to the Sweet 16 and he won nine games here his first year. Greg Marshall, obviously, is the all-time winningest coach. Phenomenal job uh, doing here. Going to Final Fours, he won 11 his first year. Uh, Kelvin Sampson won 13 his first year at Houston. And so you realize that when you're at programs that are used to winning, sometimes the transition isn't as smooth as you want. I remind myself constantly that elevators don't get to the penthouse immediately. Uh, there are levels. Uh, uh, there are floors that you have to climb and you have to go through. And so I think some of that, I mean, I think Jerome Tang, who's a really good friend, ruined it for us all. Everybody thinks that <laughs> coach your head coaches go in and they go to elite eights. And what you don't realize is that's more the anomaly uh, than it is uh, what's standard. And so yeah. I, I think that I've been used to, you know, whether I was at Baylor, my second year we won one game in conference. My last year there we were number one in the country. So I've seen the pendulum swing um, at Baylor, at ORU. 
And it, it's it's one of those things. Oh, there's a rich history here. Uh, there's a winning tradition. People show up and support. I mean, we had two wins at one point in our conference on the year, and we were drawing eight thousand a night. Uh, and, and for Sunday afternoon, one o'clock tips, right? When the Kansas City Chiefs are playing. And, and so it's one of those deals where people love basketball, but you also recognize that, man, I wish I could just add water and this stuff happened. But I, I going back to your point, there is that there are parallels. And what it is, is it's building it in a way that you believe is sustainable and not necessarily at some sort of magic potion. Oh, Sam. Hey, before we go to the uh, the shot clock, uh, I just got a tweet uh, from Quincy saying that he's resigned after comments from <laughs> Coach Mills on the Four Press podcast. Yeah. First of all, I know better because he is not on social media. Uh, 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 two, if it's eleven o'clock during a dead period, he's fishing. So uh, <laughs> I, I, he, he, he he's not. Uh, Shoot. Ah. Oh. Uh, so Sam, set it up for me. Yeah, so coach, we do a little thing called the shot clock on our uh, on our on these episodes. LT is gonna let like five or six questions just kind of fly. Some of them will be kind of fun. Some of them might lead to a story. Uh, yeah. But first thing that comes to the mind, let's 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 let it rip, LT. Okay, I'm gonna go. I always go easy in the first question. Favorite? <laughs> he says it's easy, but then it's like okay. <laughs> okay, well maybe I'll go easier then. Okay. Right. Favorite Hoosier movie character. <laughs> Man, I, I'd have to say I, I love Gene Hackman. You know, okay. I, I mean, you you just love a coach. All I ever wanted to do was be somebody who could rally a community. Man, could we put a good product on the floor that the community would be proud of? So uh, I, I know he kind of looked after Bob Knight and and did his study via Bob Knight. But uh, I, I will tell you that uh, super impressed with Norman Dale. Uh, Norm, yeah. Norm, Coach Dale. Dale. Coach Dale. I like the, pick, the picket fence, baby. The picket fence. <laughs> favorite, favorite college game day environment or atmosphere? Yeah, uh, not name Wichita State. Yep. Um, I will tell you, I, I, I know, I know, Kansas obviously, rightfully so, gets a lot of credit, but I wish people understood how hard Hilton Coliseum was to play in. Uh, mm -hmm. Iowa State is just mm -hmm. a phenomenal place and having been there I, I will tell you uh have played at Creighton I know Wichita State uh when they were in the Missouri Valley together I think Creighton does a wonderful job uh with their fan support but uh I, I'm gonna have to uh give the nod to Hilton Coliseum Sam wasn't it coach Jacobs that said like the floor like literally shakes we had coach mm -hmm. Jacobs who you obviously yeah. worked with for some time yeah he said that like literally the like the floor shakes and didn't they don't they throw pennies or money too or no was that somewhere else Sam? I, I you know I know Texas Tech throws tortillas mm -hmm. at you um but 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 uh uh I, I don't know about them I never got hit with any money uh, we'll have to we'll have to go and, back. I think it was it was we had Rex Walters, the old uh, the legendary Kansas guard, right? Yeah. Um, the last someone else said it though recently but, too. Yeah, he, he was going through because he was obviously playing in the Big Eight back then, and I think he said uh, people at Iowa State threw some pennies at him. Oh my goodness! <laughs> Either there, Oklahoma State, but okay. So one word to describe the American Athletic Conference. Man, great question. Um. Another one, another great one question. word, one word. Can't be two Physical. words. I, I know that Can't kind of words. sounds cliche, uh, but it, it is. I, I mean, the plethora of clips that I send into our head of officials after the game is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and sometimes you think it's over physical. Um, and but I, I will use the word physical. I won't tell you. I think some leagues I watch, I'm like, that's a weight room contest. Um, I don't think that's basketball, um, but but I do think that this league, if you do not have the right physical frame, uh, uh, you're not going to make this at, make it in this league. But I mean, you go look at that Florida Atlantic team last year. Uh, I'm just telling you, I mean, the dudes that they had on that team, even though that they weren't they weren't tall wise, them dudes were physical. And, yeah, they had the guy uh, from Rocky. Yeah, I, I will say that it's a physical league. Yeah, yeah. Okay, one word to describe Wichita State. Well, um, 
vibrant. Um, okay. It, it, it's uh, I, I think that that I mean, the place just basically explodes. People love the Shockers. There is no football here. And I mean, it it honestly, I can't even remember where I was. Uh, I, I think I was in Tennessee traveling back and had on a Wichita State uh, hat. And somebody came up and said, you're the head coach of our city's team. And you realize the pride uh, that people have. And so it's a vibrant, vibrant city. And it's a vibrant electric uh, atmosphere. You call it pride. We'll call it pressure. Uh, <laughs> what would you say, Coach, is your spirit animal? Wow. I'm from probably – um, th this, is, this isn't going to be great, but but I, I, I'm probably uh, – I'd say a largemouth bass. Uh, <laughs> to, simply because I can talk. Uh, I do not mind talking. I'll hear people, as y'all have seen, with with me running on uh, during during these uh, simple questions. Uh, I can go on for a little while. But what what smallmouth or what largemouth bass are? They are predators. They just kind of hang back, and then they see the bait and they just go attack it. That's me. Uh, I, I I don't desire to be charisma and be in front of the cameras and, hey, look at me. Let me tweet you every 10 minutes and tell you what great things I'm doing. I just prefer to hang on the, in the back while knowing when the time to attack is versus when the time. To <laughs> that has to be the best answer we've ever gotten so far. For sure. You're, you're leading yeah. that out of but, 45. But as as, as unique as that response was, it was also one of our faster responses we received. Yeah, yeah some, good. some coaches that's want good. to think about it for a minute. And uh, yeah. I, yeah, that was great. Uh, okay, coach, funniest recruiting story. You know what? Uh, I, I remember reading an article one time about the color blue exemplifies trust. And I started thinking about it, it was some Harvard study somewhere. And I remember reading it and it's like, all right, this is why all these schools are called blue bloods you know, from Kentucky to North Carolina to Duke, people just trust them more because of the color of their uniforms. So we were going into a recruit's house and I told coach Drew and coach Tang, uh, we were all going together. I said, let's everybody wear blue. And coach Drew was like, that's not even our school colors. Our, our colors are green and gold. I said, coach, I'm just telling you this Harvard article says wear blue. So we go in there. Uh, it's summer. It's uh, August in, in Oklahoma. It's hot. And we're in there for about 20 minutes, and it's obvious that this is not going well. So Jerome Tang, who's the head coach at K-State, he and I walk out to the car, and he's like, Mills, I can't believe you brought us here. This kid's a knucklehead. This is not going far. And he said, and by golly, you got me in long sleeve blue shirts thinking this stuff's actually going to matter, and this stuff doesn't matter. And throw, throw the word in there that comes to your mind. And he says, I cannot believe you had me doing it. And I'm just rolling laughing like – Tears are falling down my face because it's obvious that this is a screw up from the jump. But the fact that we're all in blue at a school that wears green and gold because I read some <laughs> Harvard article, I've always found amusing to this day. Yeah, that's that's pretty funny. <laughs> um, so I take it you didn't get the kid. We did not get the kid. He ended up going to a school in Oklahoma. <laughs> okay. Okay. You won't say who it is? No. I'm going to keep that one private. You can ask Jerome. He wouldn't. There's, there's no schools who wear blue, though. So at least he didn't go to <laughs> yeah. blue blood. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, so, so that whole. So that I whole. Could have been Tulsa. Could have been Tulsa. Yeah, that whole blue exemplifies trust thing. That's BS. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If you were a candle scent, what, what smell would you be? Man, you know what? I This is right up my alley. I carry candles with me simply because I stay in so many hotels. And yes. I do, not, I do not want the aroma of whatever the previous <laughs> occupant was to be yes. me absorb it for the next 24, 48 hours, oh however long. So I carry candles uh, and, and I go with tobacco, vanilla. Uh, okay. So there's like, you know, a little rustic. To, so at the end of the day, you think you're in a cabin. Uh, <laughs> but... At the same times, it it doesn't smell like it's full of cigars. Um, so I, I do like tobacco, vanilla, and do I have one? Look at here. Uh, yes. I got one. This this says lavender vanilla. Uh, okay. Uh, but yeah. but but I I actually this is right up my alley. I carry candles with me because I'm not going to deal with the scent, pleasant or unpleasant, 
of the previous hotel occupant. Uh, I'm just not going to subject myself to it. <laughs> I, I, I mean, that's a lot to unpack here. Um, <laughs> so last question, because I'm pretty much, I don't even want to ask you, but I'm going to ask you. I can only imagine your answer. So they're making a movie about your life. Yeah. Who would play you and what would be the title of the movie? One, I, I watch zero, like, like, I know, I know Hoosiers, but I, I don't, I don't know any actors. I couldn't tell you. Like, I don't, I, if you ask, I know Denzel Washington. I know Tom Cruise, um, Gene Hackman, I, obviously. Yeah. Gene Hackman, um, <laughs> Barbara I don't Hershey. Know that I could name you. I don't know that I could name you five actors. So I, I would tell you some guy who is way off the pathway in some Broadway show somewhere, trying to climb up his world, and he had and he's had some good movies at some point, but he's just a worker grinder. He may not necessarily have the looks. Uh, he, he may not necessarily have the charm or the charisma, but he's just a dude like, you know what? You can trust that guy because he's going to show up on time uh, and he's going to work hard. So whoever okay. that guy is. I got uh, it. I got it. But he might not show up in time. He might not work hard. It's like the third Baldwin brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually know who I think I know who the bald ones are. <laughs> yeah, I think it's Steven. Maybe it's Steven Ball. I don't know. So what? Let me ask you this: you get, you, Since we've kind of factored that you're going to be a Baldwin brother, what would the name of the movie movie be? I don't, man. I, I don't. I mean, look, probably, at, look at your life. Look at your background. Yeah, probably, where you're at. yeah probably keep the faith. You know, I, I will tell you that faith is important to me. Uh, I, I do think that you have to find something that's bigger than you. Um, but but I would also tell you that you need to you need to show up every day. And I, I would tell you that that people who are consistent uh, was at Janet Drew's funeral. Um, Homer Drew's wife, Scott Bryce, Dana uh, uh, mom. And you know what? What I was amazed and what I walked away with was just her faithfulness. Whether the bus got there at two o'clock in the morning or the bus returned to Valparaiso at 10 p.m., how she was there to greet her husband and the team and the faithfulness of just being there every day and people who continue to keep the faith because every day isn't sunny. And, and I would tell you, you have to have something to believe in. But I, I would tell you that I do think it's important that people keep the faith of just showing up. And there is a huge amount in my mind of credibility in just doing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love it. Yeah. I, I, that's, that's really powerful. And it's, it, it's amazing. Cause I asked Sam this, I know you're a very faith-based person and that's very respectable. How do you keep that in kind of the, the landscape of college basketball? Because I mean, it's changed. I mean, the last couple of years has been turned on its head 19 times with the NIL and the transfer portal. How, how do you keep your faith and how do you kind of preach it to your players? Uh, the the message to, you know, continue to keep going and, and fighting? Yeah, I, I think there has to be a purpose, right? I think that the purpose is, so I, the term we use around here is we major in your success. Like we, we, if I was coaching your child, I would say we major in your son's success. I'm motivated by our guys succeeding. Um, and so I think when you keep that forefront, uh, when, when you keep that at the front, like, at the end of the day, we are here to make sure that that your child succeeds, that you succeed. And you're walking them through the path of whatever it is that looks like, what it looks like off the court, what it looks like on it, what success looks like. And it may not be some measurable. Uh, I don't get into, you know, we have to get this number of wins or you have to have this amount of money in your bank account. Uh, you get into the value of the time that's being spent. And how do we get the most out of that value that whatever it is, that two hour frame to, uh, work of which we're working, I think you're constantly trying to get across to your guys what success looks like without this convolution of the outside world, uh, without them comparing themselves to whatever Instagram uh, is showing them or anything else that man let, let's let's make sure that we have a proper view of what success looks like and for us I, I mean we've won games I've been a part of where you were not happy because you realized we were just we were just better personnel wise but guys didn't approach that game the right way and I've been on the wrong end of games where I was extremely proud of a group 
uh, because you realize that, man, they gave it everything that just that free throw and or, or that particular uh, turnover, that ball did not happen to go our way. But I think you have to define success so that it doesn't get convoluted through outside voices. Yeah. Sam, would you say that I, that I was your coach for two years? Would you say that I kind of portrayed that message or no? I think it came with the maturity year after year. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> think, that's a crap answer <laughs> yeah no it's all good it's all good lt but no i mean it's like you know we see this with different coaches who have a longer tenure track right you know as they've grown as coaches you know it's like you you can and just even just spending the last 30 minutes with you coach mills you know i i get why players trust you in the locker room i get why players trust you or why families trust you in the living room Right. And it's like, it's just keeping that message consistent. And, you know, I mean, we're big fans of you. We followed you um, throughout your career and, you know, the success you had at Oral Roberts and what you're building at Wichita State. And so I want to thank you for coming on the Full Court Press podcast. I'm going to turn it over to you the last minute. If there's anything you want to share to the Wichita State fans, the Shocker student section, boosters, the city of Wichita, anything you're looking forward to this next year? Yeah. LT, Sam, thanks for. Thanks for having me. Uh, one, you're in the largest city in Kansas, uh, and so Wichita is, and it's a 50th largest city in America, and you realize that you are the team's, the city's team. Like, people care about this stuff. And I remember going through uh, different, different interviews and talking through other people, and I, I think you have to enjoy – whether you lose and you hear the city in an uproar because they're disappointed, I can't tell you how much I actually appreciate that because you're around a place that cares. And when you're around a place that cares, uh, that's that stuff's important. And I want to honor uh, the rich history here, uh, the winning tradition. And we will we will continue to get this thing moving, but uh, extremely excited about the year, confident about it and um, uh, can't wait. Uh, I, I wish November 4th was here, but uh, we've got a few months uh, before it is a little over 11 weeks and we'll, we'll, we'll be raring to go. Coach, and we can't wait. Sam might actually see you when you play SLU in Kansas City. All right. Open up All right. As of right now, you open up against Northern Iowa. Coach Jake at home. You also play your boy. Western, Western Kentucky. At, we open up with oh, Western Kentucky. Oh, you open up Western Kentucky? Okay. Yeah. At, at Western Kentucky. They haven't Ooh. updated the schedule on the uh, Go Shockers website, so I know. Yeah, that's you've, why you've only got up. one, two. You've got an MTE and three other dates. So I'm a little bit. Con- one of the questions is going to say that you're kind of behind in scheduling, <laughs> but we won't go there. But yeah, well, uh, I think we'll release it soon. But uh, yeah. thank goodness we're done. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's good to hear because that seems like a constant, uh, consistent message each week that coaches still have a date or two that they need to schedule. Yeah. So I'm happy to hear that. Yeah. But Coach, you're going to stick on with us for one more second, but uh, thanks for joining us. Check out the Shockers, year two of the Coach Mills era. Uh, thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and view to the Full Court Press Podcast, a college basketball experience. And if you need any painting uh, duties, check out uh, Mills's painting service in Wichita, Kansas, serving the greater Wichita, Kansas. Karate now kid. for one minute. Side to side. <laughs> Side to side. So, Sam, we'll be back next week with another great episode. So, thanks for joining us. Let's get it.